building in public and we've got neil is it neil jean or neil john jean yeah neil jean okay just like blue jeans yeah. uh, and not french so not french. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome and then we also have Anne lee skates from a16z is joining so thanks Anne, for coming hey everyone <laughs> hey james so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, you recognize some people from the audience. Actually, yeah. we sort of stole James. James has kind of a, a standing uh, every other Friday series that uh, we've been starting to do, talking about the future. <laughs> nice. But um, wow. Yeah. You know, kind of. I think he calls it "Building in Public 2030." Yeah. But, um, <laughs> That's awesome. But we're we're excited to to get together to to discuss what you're doing with Beacons. Um, you know, I think we were aware that uh, there's a, a big fundraising announcement that just happened. Uh, we can certainly talk about that. We also, um, we just, you know, we're sort of like, you know, startup and product geeks. And we just love to like learn about like the story of like where this came from and where it's going and how did it come to be and sort of what stage of evolution that is. So, you know, I think, you know, I often like to just kind of start kind of to understand a little bit, Neil, kind of. What's your story? How did Beacons come to be? How long has it been around? What sort of led you to, to decide to start working on this? Yeah, um, there's through a series of pivots. <laughs> I actually want to hear, um, you should tell the pivot stories. I don't, I didn't yeah. even know fully about the first hardware one. Yeah, because uh, hardware it was like a YC, like you and a bunch of, was it like your Stanford PhD friends were doing mm -hmm. some hardware stuff in YC? Yeah, yeah. I guess Ann didn't do enough due diligence. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell the full backstory now. Um, yeah, so we went through YC in summer of 2019. Um, and at the time, it was me and two co-founders. We have four now. Um, and uh, the three of us were PhD students at Stanford. We all worked in, like, different areas of machine learning. And during our last years, we were like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we, like, did a startup with our friends? It would be so cool. Um, I lived in student housing at the time. So our first idea was to build um, a face recognition smart lock for my apartment. And, you know, we went to Home Depot, bought like a door, put it in my bedroom, my girlfriend was pissed. Um, and uh, we connected like uh, a Raspberry Pi with a small camera to an August smart lock. And we were running like, um, so we were all from like machine learning backgrounds. We were building these like small neural networks to run at the edge. And we did build a prototype outside my apartment that like worked some of the time and actually i i still have it um oh yeah oh. so, <laughs> awesome yeah. hardware demo um, oh wow yeah so um <laughs> this is what we actually brought to our yc interview um and one, one of our friends uh, told us to apply so we loaded up like all of the yc partners faces on the rest <laughs> Cause we didn't know who was going to interview us. Um, and then, uh, I think the demo worked like on the second try. And then, so after we got into YC, it was with this idea. Um, then we had to decide if we wanted to actually try to build a company around this, like more like project. And we realized that three software PhDs were probably going to fail at building a consumer hardware company. Um, mm -hmm. we pivoted away from that. Um, even before we got in, like started YC and during YC worked on a couple of different things. Um, yeah, I would say we were one of the bad YC companies in our batch. We really got much traction. Um, near the end of YC, we pivoted into something that was kind of like cameo for content creators. And that's what we uh, eventually pitched at demo day. I think I actually talked to Anne during like this is when we met, yeah, and and I think I knew about this sort of thing, but not in not to this extent. Yeah, so at, at the time, uh, Anne passed on us because we were not a good investment. But, <laughs> <laughs> but good. I love the fact that the name stuck because when I know no. what a little bit about what Beacons is today, I thought the name was made for this current product, whereas you've got this this board with Beacons AI on it. So that was the original name and it kind of kept through the transitions. Yeah. Um, so there's another story behind the name. Actually, the name comes from like five or six years ago. Um, my younger brother um, wanted to, we were just like talking about stuff and he was like, oh, we should build like a dating app called Beacons. And <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> the idea for the dating app was like you would get these virtual beacons that you could put in physical locations in the world and then you would see people who went to those same places and right? mm. so like kind of use these virtual beacons as a way to partition the world and like you are like the places you go kind of, type mm. of thing. Mm. Um, so right. i think when he graduated i bought him the domain name just as kind of like a joke uh, <laughs> and then when we started working on the door thing that was like the only domain <laughs> we had so we just decided to use it <laughs> <laughs> wow Oh, it really works. Yeah. yeah, it's a good name. So nothing we do has been planned. It just kind of happened. <laughs> yeah. So so you were telling us about the evolution. You sound like you were doing kind of this cameo creators tool coming that was coming out of YC or that was sort of, that was how the, did that all work? That was like the last month of YC. So right before that, we had actually, let's tell the whole story since we have an hour. Um, so the first month of YC, we tried to build something that was kind of like smart Trello. And the idea there was like, we were using Trello for our work and we realized that we created a lot of like implicit documentation just as a mm -hmm. natural by byproduct of doing work. And a lot of that old work that we did actually would be useful for future stuff we were doing, but you know, nobody's got time to like go back and like look at old documentation. So we thought we could build some kind of like AI system to automatically resurface useful information um, that would help with whatever you're working on next. Um, it turned out that we were not good enough at building software at the time to actually like execute against that idea. Uh, so it was hard even to build a prototype that our team wanted to use. Um, so then we were like, okay, well, maybe we can do something that's more like machine learning related since that's what all of our backgrounds are. Um, so the first idea that we had in the creator economy was actually to use um, kind of like modern NLP. Uh, that's a really good screenshot. Um, uh, you got a screenshot? Or that I like, video. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so our first idea was to parse Instagram comments um, and help brands find uh, creators to work with. Because right? um, I think even today for influencer marketing, lots of people do this kind of like manual um, calculation of engagement ratios, like number of likes and comments over number of followers. And one, it seemed like that could be automated. And two, it felt like we could um, extract more predictive features of performance. Like comments are not all the same. A lot of people just send emojis, um, yeah. like comments like, oh, I think you're so attractive or whatever. And like, those are not that predictive of downstream performance. But we thought we could extract, for example, questions where people are asking like, what are you wearing? Where can I buy that? How much does that cost? And those would be better features um, for predicting conversion. Um, so we worked on that for a while, um, built like a, a demo and had one like pilot customer, but um, realized that we weren't that excited to help the brands evaluate creators. We actually thought there were a lot of interesting problems around helping creators monetize. Hmm. Um, so then we tried to build the Cameo competitor uh, specifically for content creators, realized that Cameo was doing a better job than we were. And creators didn't really want to use beacons for that. Um, but we learned a couple of things there. Um, and around that time, we also saw uh, mostly Linktree on Instagram um, taking mm -hmm. off in the link and bio space and realized that that was like a big pain point for creators where most creators are now creating content on multiple platforms and also trying to monetize on multiple platforms. So they really need something to kind of like connect in the middle. So mm -hmm. that's how we eventually made our way to beacons. Yeah. And how did you, like, when you're looking at, you know, Linktree taking off, uh, there's certainly, like, you know, a lot of momentum, and there's certain creators that are sort of probably early adopters with big audiences. And how did you think about, like, you know, what you were going to do to uniquely serve the market? Or were you just going to, you know, big, fast expanding, you're going to go after, like, a different segment? Or how do you think about, like, the decisions in, you know, seeing something working and then deciding to do something relevant but different? Yeah. I think, um, you know, our, our thinking has like kind of evolved over time in the beginning. I don't think, uh, I think our thinking was very simple. We looked at Linktree and like no shade, but we were like, oh, it's like one link <laughs> or links, right? We, we could probably build something like that and like maybe make it a little bit nicer, make the UX a little bit better. Um, and then over time, as we started working on it, we realized that Link and Bio is actually like a really good entry point. Um, like a really good wedge to eventually build a lot of other things, right? Because it's upstream mm -hmm. of almost everything else in the creator economy. So you can either integrate with those downstream platforms or try to bring some of that functionality up closer to where the audience is. 
Right. Yeah. And I, I've noticed like a bunch of, I mean, we talk about Lincoln bio stuff all the time here <laughs> on building in public. I feel like we, we probably have like, you know, dozen, dozen different discussions around these at least. Um, yeah. But I know that sometimes we've seen people take things that are like very uh, kind of vertical focus. So I think like, was it Nexus GG is like kind of a Lincoln bio for Twitch streamers or game, you know, people who would be selling game commerce stuff. Um, do you see like a specific vertical focus as like where you can really get a lot of traction momentum where people either aren't using existing tools or kind of where you can still pe- fill special needs? Uh, yeah, Anne's always asking me this question too. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, I will say, or I, no, Neil, you should go first and then um, I'll add something. I think um, we always wanted to find like a specific vertical that we can serve really well. And I think that is kind of like the conventional wisdom um, is like, you know, serve some segment of users really well and then expand from there. And I don't know if it was like our own incompetence or whatever, but we were never able to find like one vertical that we could just like understood their problems really well and then built stuff specifically for them. So we've always just taken this more like horizontal go to market approach and um I think over time we kind of realized that that does make sense um, because um, we are, I think, basically just a website builder. And even though mm-hmm. different creators in different categories might have different ways to monetize farther downstream, I think for the website layer, their needs are pretty similar. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I will say so, uh, one thing that really impressed us was uh, Beacons had really significant penetration amongst um, TikTok users. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I I think this goes with the, this is, you know, a slick, right, like modern and very fun product and product design. Um, And it was, it's very easy to use. You can set it up on your phone in a few clicks. Um, All of that, uh, it's a bit similar to TikTok in that, right? Like I don't don't actually need to leave TikTok to record a TikTok ready, potentially Mm -hmm. viral video. (laughs) Um, so it really resonated with that bucket of users. And that's obviously where um, a lot of future creators will come from. Yeah. yeah. How did that come about? Like, was that a very specific push that you were trying to, like, get into the TikTok ecosystem? Or, how, like, what, what have been your thoughts around how to work with TikTok creators? Yeah, uh, it was pretty intentional, I think. Um, so uh, we launched the product originally last January. Um, so a little bit over a year ago, but in kind of like a private beta. And we're mostly focused on Instagram at the time. Um, and uh, so it was in private beta from like January to like September. Um, and then during that time, I started using TikTok a lot. And I was like, wow, this platform is way better than Instagram. Um, and we realized that there are a couple characteristics of TikTok that um, probably made it make more sense for us to focus there. Um, one was that um, I think on TikTok, creators tend to get like really big, really fast and don't have a lot of other infrastructure around um, to help them build their businesses. So there's more of an opportunity to like come in early and help them. And then the other is like the mo- the way that TikTok distributes content is through the algorithm and not through not as much through the follower graph, which means that consumers are always consumers and creators because creators are on TikTok like as consumers too. Um, they're always seeing content from new people, right? And when you see content from new people, the way to go and like learn more about them is to go to their profile where you'll see their link in bio. Right? Um, so I think that the content distribution was like pretty advantageous for, for us too. So are you going to like somebody as you're seeing them take off and you kind of show up and you're like here instead of promoting your SoundCloud page, whatever, use beacons? Wait, sorry, can you say that again? I was just saying, like, did you just wait for content to start popping and then you go reach out to the people who have a kind of a new hit piece of content so maybe they don't have that infrastructure built out and then you can just, like, address their needs that they just recently discovered they they have? They Like, they maybe don't think of themselves as a business yet and you kind of are, you know, there at that point when they may become one? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, like, kind of the example of the first point, I guess. Um, which is that they don't have a lot of that infrastructure set up yet. Um, yeah. Um, so what we did basically was in the beginning, it was very manual. We would just find creators uh, who were pretty big already, but maybe didn't have like a website yet, build one for them and then mm-hmm. get them on beacons. And then after a while, um, 
like we're kind of lucky because whenever someone uses the product, it's very visible. Yeah. Um, new creators would just see other creators using it and then sign up. So today, most okay. of our growth just comes through that flywheel. And are people thinking about like like a set of transactions? Like my understanding of the Linktree ecosystem is that it's really driven on like optimizing kind of commerce options uh, that somebody might have, but that would be somebody already has maybe some existing kind of business infrastructure around them, whereas you're finding these new people. So are you helping them figure out what to do with their business or do they kind of figure that part out and then you're kind of this expression canvas? I think we would like to help them figure it out more in the future. Um, and there could be like some machine learning approaches to that where, you know, you, if you're kind of like these other creators who are su succeeding in these ways, we can help recommend that, have, be more prescriptive about it to people. Um, I think today, um, it's mostly still as like a pass through for traffic to downstream platforms. Um, but we're starting to bring like pieces of those transactions up into beacons now, for example, like donations or selling digital products. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think about like the category of just like direct paying the creators? Is that something that you're excited about? Or do you think that belongs more in the hands of other kind of platforms themselves or? Um, I think it's something that we're excited about. We already enable like several types of direct payments within fully within beacons. Um, and uh, to be honest, like I think those features that we have aren't that good yet. So there's still a lot of work that we can do there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's something that we're excited about. Yeah. I'm actually also curious to ask since we have like you and Anne together, um, here, like, what were your first few, what were those first few conversations like? Yeah. And what did you think of Neil when you first met him? Like, you were there as this iteration was happening. Like, take us behind the scenes of how you got to know yeah. each other. But. Yeah. Um, so we met first through uh, close mutual friends. So I, I knew Neil and the whole team were very smart. And obviously, you know, they're all Stanford PhDs in machine learning. So how could they not be incredibly smart mm -hmm. um, just from based on background? I knew they were yeah, brilliant. Um, when we first met, uh, um, as Neil mentioned, uh, I think the company they were first working on was very, very early. And I remember, I forget, there were maybe like two handfuls of users or something like that. Um, so I thought this is a category I'm very interested in. Um, and these are really smart people. Uh, but it's so early. Um, I don't really know uh, if this particular product will be the one that takes, really resonates and takes off. Um, uh, over the years, uh, we've caught up a bit, um, not too much actually, because everyone at Beacons was really busy building things. Um, and I joined Andreessen. We actually met before I even joined Andreessen. Um, and, uh, as, as they made progress, I think it became gra gradually, um, once this current product iteration of the product launched, um, this was maybe late last year, it became very obvious that there was something that was very interesting. Um, and uh, my, myself and my whole team had been pursuing and looking at the Lincoln bio space and looking at the creator monetization space really deeply. So we probably met every company or almost every, I don't want to say every company, but most of the companies building in this broader category and have very strong viewpoints on, um, on product, on growth loops, on, uh, you know, kind of uh, the wedge into the market and beyond. Um, so when we caught up with Neil again, uh, it was, it, it became very obvious that they were onto something and this paired with such a strong engineering team, which we typically don't see as much in this space, uh, made them a really compelling investment. And we had to work very hard to, uh, try to convince Neil. That was awesome. So Neil, what was convincing? Yeah. Uh, well, I've known Anne for a long time now, so um, I think, you know, it, was, it felt, like, very comfortable. Um, I think Anne was, like, very kind when she described our first meeting. It was, like, <laughs> like it was very early. We were just, like, hella dumb at that point. Like, didn't have <laughs> um, Yeah, so I think we had, like, one active user and maybe, like, $20 in revenue or something. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we... How, that, was, that was back in, like, January 2020 or so? That was probably like private beta. 
Oh, no, that was actually before. It was like summer 2019, I think. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, Neil, how did you think about like who... I mean, I thought it was really interesting reading that you did some fundraising on Republic before. And like, how did you think about who you wanted to raise from and how to go about that whole process? Yeah, yeah I think you, I, I would love to hear the, your assessment of the Republic experience yeah. at, um, a bit after. I feel like there's been some people like tweeting about this this week on, on Twitter. And yeah, I saw some tweets <laughs> too. I think they, they made us look like smarter than we actually were. <laughs> um, because, you know, we weren't sure that, uh, we weren't that sure that, like, creators would want to invest in us, um, that we'd be able to kind of, like, fill the, or we, we thought we'd be able to, but, like, most companies do the Republic thing or, like, the crowdfunding thing after they raise kind of, like, from institutional investors. Um, so, you know, we we're, were a little bit worried, like, oh, will we set, like, some kind of valuation expectations by doing this? Or will it look bad if, like, no, none of our creators want to invest? Um, but we thought it was like really aligned with our whole like mission around trying to create these new economic opportunities for creators um, to, because most of the platforms and the tools that creators use to build their businesses, like they don't really get a chance to be a stakeholder in those platforms, right? Like if you're a creator and you basically build your whole life and your business on TikTok, but like you don't get a chance to invest in TikTok until like, by dancing with the public really, right? Yeah. Um, and like, if you look at companies in other spaces like Airbnb or DoorDash or whatever, like the people that they built their businesses on, like the drivers and the hosts, like most of them, um, I think Airbnb did give some equity to like super hosts or something. But for the most part, those were not the people who kind of I don't know, got rich when, when the company IPO, right? It was like the early investors um, and the founders, I guess. Um, so we, you know, I think um, the crowdfunding campaign is just like a first step towards that. I think it would become a lot more common in the next few years for companies to do stuff like that and get their community involved. Um, yeah, but we, you know, it was kind of like experimental for us too. And um, yeah, we didn't so really that press it too broadly. Um, like we didn't have Republic advertise the crowdfunding campaign and we didn't really like publicize it. Um, we just kind of advertised it to our, our user base. Maybe we'll do a much bigger, try to do a much bigger one next year or something. And what was what was the sequencing on that? This was after YC, but before N. Yeah, or, it was. Yeah, like, and Neil had also raised the pre-seed round in between as well, and he has some great investors there too. Yeah, so we had done a pre-seed um, right after YC in 2019, and then we did the crowdfunding round in February this year. Um, so like right a couple weeks before oh, cool. uh, and yeah it sounds like the, um, the crowdfunding it says you, it sounds like you were just kind of marketing it internally to your creators how did you I, I, we're we're only high level familiar with the republic platform how does right. how does it work do you like select who can invest and do you actually create like allocations or approve investors or how does that how do the mechanics work to make sure that you serve the needs that you're you stating yeah, I think you can kind of approve people, although we, we just like let people invest and we didn't really like, we didn't make the creators like fill out a survey or anything like that. Um, but uh, if you run a campaign on Republic, it's going to be public to everyone. But usually for most of their com campaigns, Republic will kind of market the campaign to their investor base through like emails and stuff. Um, and I guess some companies maybe run ads too. Um, and we just chose not to do that stuff and just like email our active users and tell them about it. Yeah. And we, I think we worked with Republic to set a lower limit of like $50 as a minimum investment. Um, cause a lot of our creators are not, uh, like experienced investors. So many of them mm -hmm. probably haven't even invested in like public companies before, much less like in the early stage. So, yeah. And then, uh, we like to tell our, creators that they can now say they're co-investors with Ann and Andreessen Horowitz and they actually yeah. got better terms than they did. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, um, I'm actually so curious like for what percentage of the that investor base this was their first rate right, like equity investment of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could ask them. We're sending out a survey soon. So Nice. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. So you feel like the 
the, will the crowdfunding thing continue with each round? Like even if you go additional institutional rounds, you would kind of do that in conjunction with additional crowdfund or crowd raisers? Um, I'm trying not to think about any more fundraising for as long, <laughs> but uh, I think we would definitely consider it. I think there's still some um, just like friction around crowdfunding where um, I guess like our, our council wasn't like that familiar with crowdfunding. So I'm pretty sure we racked up a bunch of legal fees. We'll sort that out mm -hmm. later. Um, and there's like limits on how many crowdfunding investors you can have. So I think it's hard if you wanted to raise like a really big community round, it could be pretty tough. Um, or I think if you go over some limit of investors, I think there's additional like just kind of like disclosure requirements and just like more work that you have to do. Um, so I'm hoping that someday we can do this on like some crypto platform and then it'll just be really seen mm -hmm. like programmatic and automated. We'll right. see. Yeah, definitely something we would consider. Do people, uh, do investors in Republic get information rights? Uh, no, they don't. Got it. Okay. But and they they understand that. Um, I I think some of them understand that. Others yeah. probably don't super understand what's going on. I think right. for us, right. we'll probably try to share information with them pretty regularly because um, that was kind of like the whole point was to get them mm -hmm. involved. Um. But uh, I don't think there's any like requirements to do that. Do you imagine you would start to have uh, kind of asks on people who may want to be involved in future financing rounds? Like uh, you could imagine, you know, in the same way that like when venture capitalists get allocation, there's sometimes services or kind of uh, you know value add that people are expected to bring along. I wonder if you think about how you might be able to structure the type of value add you'd hope from the community? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think we, we haven't thought through it that much yet, um, but maybe we could like, uh, maybe limit it to like active users or like in the future, like you're expected to help like post about stuff that we're doing. Um, but we, we honestly haven't thought through that too much. Yeah. I think for this first one, it was like anyone who uses Beacons and wants to invest, like we're happy to have you. And how do you do things like set evaluation in when it's kind of, there's not a particular lead? Is that something that you do or Republic does or um, a Dutch auction mechanic? <laughs> so I've only done it once, um, but for us, it was kind of like a discussion between us and Republic. And mm -hmm. um, because we weren't raising like a huge amount on Republic, I think we were less like, it was like one foot like short phone call where we kind of talked about it and i was like oh i think this is like roughly right and then we just like added a discount to to the valuation because um you know we want to make sure like the crowdfunding investors got like some benefit for coming in a little bit mm -hmm. yeah i actually was also curious uh slightly um different topic but and you were talking about how you did such a deep dive into the space and like Packy's memo about Beacon said there were like 50 something Lincoln bio companies. I'm kind of curious what um, you saw, like what kind of interesting, weird, random things were people playing around with in terms of like how they thought about Lincoln bio. And like, I think a lot of people hear that and they're like, okay, like a link that leads to other links, but there's like trying to get out some of the like nuance and yeah. depth. did you notice? Okay. I think broadly um, in what I saw, and so this is like collectively my team, um, our the A16Z consumer team and I met most of the companies. So I wouldn't say I personally met all of the, you know, 50 companies or so, but I would say I would segment the, the companies I met into three buckets. So one is like you guys mentioned, more vertically focused and specific. So it could be for gamers, it could be, um, you know, for, for foodies, it could be, uh, I'm trying to think of like typically large enough sectors where there's a lot of influencers. Um, so that's one bucket. Another bucket is more horizontal and generalized. And um, they could either monetize through being a SaaS tool or um, have ambitions to, you know, monetize through downstream monet creator monetization tools. Um, so, so be more a bit more transactional and more like a marketplace. Um, then the third bucket uh, were um, tools that were also had a LinkedIn bio, but they actually wanted to go 
uh, upstream, I guess is how to put it. Um, so they're thinking about how do I, uh, how can I help you manage um, uh, your your um, fan relationships in your community and almost be like a very lightweight CRM um, to help you deepen your relationships and to really understand your relationships and have all the analytics behind your fan relationships across all different channels. Um, so those are those are sort of the three buckets, and beacons obviously um, fit into the second uh, bucket. And we particularly liked that uh, the vision was not just uh, to monetize via a SaaS tool, but the vision was to build out more, um, you know, transactional ways for creators to monetize. So is the, we, I guess we haven't talked that much about the business, but is the, the idea of the business is to be kind of a transactional platform, not, not like its own media tool as much as it's like a, like a, like a, I don't know if you should call it like a payments platform or like an integrated with other kind of uh, transactions. How, how do you, how do you think about like the sec segment that this kind of cuts at? Do you want to take this in? This one's a hard <laughs> this is what we're trying to figure out. Um, so the way that we're kind of thinking about the creator economy is like, there's roughly like three layers. So um, at the top, there's like the content platform layer, like TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. At the bottom, there is kind of like this layer of vertical monetization platforms that creators use to monetize. Um, so these could be like Cameo, Patreon, OnlyFans, Shopify, Etsy. Um, more every day because everyone is building um, kind of platforms in this bottom layer. And because there's this growing fragmentation in both the bottom layer and the top layer where, you know, creators are using multiple platforms on both sides, they need something like us, right? And I think um, in the beginning, um, we're just like this connective tissue that kind of routes traffic from the top layer to the bottom layer. But over time, um, so in the beginning, as that connective tissue, I think the business model is basically like a subscription SaaS, right? Kind of like a traditional website builder. Um, but over time, um, there will be opportunities to kind of vertically integrate into different pieces in that bottom layer, whether that's through like third party integrations or by building native functionality into um, our platform. So um, the challenge, I think, is there's so many things in the bottom layer that you could integrate with. Like how do you prioritize and sequence those things and which ones do you want to try to build natively? Which ones do you want to integrate with? Um, you know, do you want to be friends with everyone or do you want to start to compete in certain verticals? Um, and I think those are all questions that, um, that uh, Anne needs to help me figure out. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm tell Anne she has to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Anne, go figure it out. And then just go back in. <laughs> Let us yeah. know. <laughs> I mean, it is like, I mean, I'm just, how do you even start thinking about how to figure this out? Like, what are signals that are useful that you can start picking up on? Or like, as someone in, in your seat right now, like talking to your co-founders or whatever, week by week, like, what are the earliest like hints that you want to pick up on when you're making that decision? Yeah, it's, it, it really is like a super, I think, tough problem for us. Um, and like right now we're, we're a really small team. We're only four people. So there's just not, we can't do everything at once. So it's important to prioritize. Um, I think one advantage that we have sitting in this middle layer is that um, we actually have first party data on like where all the traffic is going. Mm -hmm. So um, there is some kind of like, proxy for where creators are finding value today mm -hmm. um, but it's still very early like I think the creator economy is super early so um, that could change over time but that's that's one thing that kind of like guides what we work on is um, by looking at our like actually looking at real data um, I think another framework that we kind of have is thinking about um, you know do we want to build more like horizontal infrastructure like pieces of our platform or do we want to build more like kind of like vertical use cases on top of that infrastructure. Um, so yeah, those are kind of like some tools that, that we use to, to help us prioritize, but I don't really know if we're doing a great job at it. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of decisions to make and they're, they're pretty tough sometimes. One of the things I've noticed is that, you know, when I look at Beacon's AI, it has a very different aesthetic than a typical link and bio kind of company might where instead of being purely utilitarian, it, it's bright colors and it feels more like you guys care about 
how it looks and how the bios or how the you know the pages look and so it has like much more of a design and an aesthetic to it i wonder do you you know i think a lot of these historically have been a little bit more you know utilitarian and transactional and i think you certainly have that and it seems like that's a lot of the focus but i almost thought you were going to come here and say no no we're all this self expression canvas and that's how we differentiate and that's what's different so how do you think about sort of the the need or the value of serving kind of self expression along with the transactional stuff that you're doing yeah i i think it's super important actually and i thought you were going to say it looks really janky um <laughs> like um I think design is super important. Our team is not actually very strong in that area. Like we were all engineers. So we've kind of like learned enough Figma to like get by. And I think yeah. we give creators a lot of freedom to design their pages how they want. But I think there's a lot that we can do to make it easier for them to do that. Like maybe the ceiling is already like decently high, but it's very hard to get close to that for them. Um, and, you know, a big part of like, what's important to creators is just being able to kind of design their own kind of like personal identity online. Right. And a lot of that is just like how you present yourself and how things look. And I think part of our thesis is that creators are just kind of like the first wave or like the vanguard of this, where more and more people in different, even very traditional professions, like will start to kind of try to construct their lives around their online identities. And we'll need a place to kind of like, express that that's separate from because right now we have like linkedin and twitter and TikTok, right which all capture like different pieces of our identities but um you know i have a TikTok, but like i think my TikTok doesn't capture everything that i would like the world to know about about me mm -hmm. yeah totally presumably... that sentiment has come a couple times in conversations we've had where like people have very fragmented digital identities online. So like beyond even just thinking about creators transacting, I think the, I think when we started talking more about NFTs on building in public is when like link and bio really honestly, like became a huge topic because it was like, okay, people are buying these things to self express, but like, where do you showcase them? And so I don't know, I think there's a lot of like adjacent trends as well beyond the monetization that probably are really interesting. And you guys are thinking about Mishy, we should you should do a brainstorming session with them. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what this is. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can we can talk about that now. I think that's interesting. Yeah. We, yeah. we, yeah. Have, a, we do have, have a tea up in bed block, but it's kind of crappy right now. But um maybe it'll be better in the future. <laughs> An NFT in bed. Yeah, so you can embed NFTs to your Beacons page from, like, OpenSea or something. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Do people actually use it? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I use it, yeah. Um, early days. Yeah, early days. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say, you know, Misty, do you want to lay out a little bit of the, the discussion that we've been having around kind of the trophy case in the sort of layers of NFT? Because I think... Yeah. You know, the the different the different kind of layers that we've discussed, I think there's a natural fit where beacons could feel like a trophy case style use case within that sort of NFT ecosystem. I don't know if you yeah. have that top of top of mind in a few weeks. I found the Google Doc where Stupe okay. and I had Paki's piece on NFTs and we were like highlighting it together and thinking of questions. And I think this is where a lot of the Lincoln bio conversation started. But um, I think we were basically thinking about, like, take NFTs, for example, or anything that people collect is only valuable if you have, like, a gathering place where people whose opinion you care about are going to come and see that you have that object. So, like, what is that on the Internet was kind of the thought. Like, what is mm -hmm. your trophy case or what is your, like, town plaza where you know that, like, your squad will basically come and be checking up on what you have and, like, care about it because otherwise, like, the social kind of impetus to buy these things is pretty much non-existent. It's, like, the equivalent of if I'm, like, a rich socialite, I buy, buy a product person, go to, like, the Met Gala because I know other people are going to, like, look at the fact that I have that. So just thinking about that phenomenon on the Internet, not only with, like, people buying huge nfts and auctions or whatever maybe that's like more akin to the prada going to the met gala thing but every niche probably has its own version of that and it's it might not be nfts it might be like other things you want to showcase like 
I'm just thinking out loud right now. I haven't really thought about this before, but maybe like you want to showcase that you collaborate with someone else. Like you're a food influencer and you want to showcase that you're like actually best friends with this other top food influencer or whatever. Kind of like, what are the social status things that people would want to show in their digital identity, whether it's like objects or relationships or collabs and like, how does that play into link in bio and digital homepages also. I think it's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Can so I the, um, the digital goods uh, thing is really interesting. Uh, I was going to say, uh, Beacons actually has a um, community feature that's similar to, like, you know, like, it's it's a little bit like, who do you want to be seen with? Or who do you want to be seen to be associated with? Neil, if, I don't know if you want to talk more about it. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to like share screen on here? Or really? Yeah. Yeah, you can here. Okay. We just enabled screen share. So you should see it on nice. the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Th yeah. There's a couple of features that are kind of related to this. You guys do this. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um one of our creators um, and she, she mostly makes content on TikTok. And um, she uses this like friends block feature to kind of link to other creators that she's like collaborated with or are friends with. Um, so this is, uh oh, are you guys still there? Yeah. Oh. Yep, we're here. Yeah, we can. So I think this is like a little bit relevant to what you're just talking about. And then um, on my own Beacons page, um, I have like a community block where my not very many followers can like sign up and kind of publicly show their support um, for my mediocre TikTok content. Um, and then here I have my only NFT that I made <laughs> myself because I'm too poor to buy anyone else's NFTs. <laughs> but yeah, these are these are things these that are we're, we're definitely interested in exploring more. Yeah, that's really cool. It reminds me of like we were talking to read.cv um, in terms of like rethinking LinkedIn and kind of endorsements and kind of like social cred and how people share that ac across platforms as well. Kind of reminds me of what you were saying with the my community feature on your page, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I think uh, you guys remember like MySpace top eight. Yeah. <laughs> I think people just like really love to show like their affiliations with other people with organizations and um, right now there aren't like super flexible ways um, online to like connect with any kind of entity. Um, so that's, that's something that I'd be excited to, to, to think about like building these kinds of graphs. Yeah. When you mentioned the graph, what, what is the kind of, is the underlying graph here uh, going to be pretty different than one that exists elsewhere? Is it sort of itself an aggregation of other graphs? Or how do you think about sort of the structure that ends up as a residual of this? Uh, yeah, our thinking is very early, but it might be just like one graph that sits on top of all these other ones. For example, like the friends block, um, you can add other users on beacons, but you can also add users on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Right, so you can kind of bring together these different people from all these different places in a way that you couldn't do natively on any of those platforms. That's really cool. Yeah. It's almost like people also interact with different people across these different platforms. So you could kind of get a very full picture of like Neil's life. Like who does he talk to on LinkedIn the most? And who does he talk to on Instagram the most? And it, it becomes like pulling together, not only like your kind of things that you're selling, but relationships and then yeah. other people can like draw upon those. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, for this graph, like, because it's on your own website, you control, like, all the edges, um, and no one can kind of, like, take that away from you. So. Yeah. You mentioned kind of the concept of website builder, and I think it's, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I don't know how much you mentioned crypto, too, so I don't know how much you follow kind of these ideas around decentralization of networks, but, uh, you know, one could imagine taking a beacons and using it to actually host on their own custom domain. And then that domain becomes their identity endpoint. Is that something that you're like excited about already doing? I see Anne shaking her head. Yes. Is that something you're already doing? And sort of how do you think about how kind of that may fit into like a decentralized identity that maybe gets managed through beacons? 
yeah that's that's something we're already doing that's actually like the main feature in our like paid plan is to use a custom domain with your beacons website oh cool like, part of the motivation there was like you know creators are kind of like this new class of businesses and we don't want them to they shouldn't feel like they're running like a beacon subsidiary they're like running their own business um, right. they should con control like their own website you know like I don't think beacons would have like an aws.com slash beacons like home right. page, right? Yeah. Um, so that's definitely part of it. And then I think creators and crypto are kind of like both part of this longer term trend towards decentralization and kind of like, I don't know, trust in shifting towards individuals. Um, so uh, we are definitely interested in doing more stuff in that area in the future. I mean, it's, I think it's particularly interesting because of how like philosophically unattached you are to like exactly where the graphs live and where the identities live <clears throat> you know a lot of times i think when people think about decentralization in terms of communication tools it's hard to get your head around how it's going to fit into you know a first party service building an identity structure that is decentralized um but because you're sort of explicitly a bit agnostic around where the identities live and how they stitch together, that almost feels like an area that you could lean into to like, you let people have their endpoint at at whatever domain they want. Sure, they can do beacons.ai, but they can also run it on their own site. And then the actual connections that are brokered could maybe be a beacons.ai, but they also could be a TikTok identity or some other third party identity. And I think that the, like, if you really fast forward you know, the world's like, what would a decentralized social networking tool look like? I think it would not be so reliant on necessarily, um, you know, s serving all of the identities first party, but it would be more focused like you are on kind of this paid plan to empower people with paid infrastructure tools. But then the identities, you know, you don't need to monopolize identities or attention in the way that kind of like historical uh, social networks had to. Um, yeah. Like one thing that we joke about is that like content platforms come and go, but websites are forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, uh, URL is kind of like open protocol. Like anyone in the world can access it and anyone in the world can like have their own website. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could almost use SMTP as your messenger, right? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, this is definitely something that, that we'll probably think about more in the future. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, these these may be too far afield, so maybe we rewind it a little bit to, like, today. So I think you said you're four people now. You've now got a well-capitalized company. What sort of – what's on the very near term? Are, are you hiring? What are, your, what are your roles look like? What are you trying to sort of expand uh, to fill out some, some of the new needs in the company? Yeah, um, we're definitely hiring. Um, this is something that's, like, new to me. Um, you know, haven't done it before, but, uh, if you guys know any good software engineers who are interested in the creator economy, definitely send them our way. Or uh, good software engineers interested in working with other really great software, right? Like highly technical people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so definitely hiring. Um, and then, uh, you mentioned design. Are you, do you currently have you mentioned that you guys have gotten competent at Figma, but you don't have necessarily a design professional. Is that a an area that you're looking to find somebody to own? Yeah, for sure. Um, right now we're working with like some designers in like kind of contract roles, but also looking to add like a full-time designer to the team. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think uh, we just need some more people to go after all these different product ideas that we have. So, right. Yeah. And so it sounds like a lot of kind of computer science background would be more roles in that background and then maybe a designer is there any anything else in terms of operational stuff uh you know i don't know bd or partnerships or monetization or anything there or is it kind of still going to be more focused on the kind of cs and maybe design yeah i think the other stuff we're still kind of like figuring it out as we go um mm -hmm. and then on, on the software side like our stack is like python and react so pretty standard um that's helpful yeah mm -hmm. I've got to imagine you've got uh, when whenever you are letting people pay, you know, uh, you must have people who expect something more, you know, 
some somebody who's paying has has some problems or something that they'd like different. So do you have like an explicit workflow right now around customer success or around kind of how you manage the, um, you know, kind of inbound problems or requests or are you guys handling that all yourselves? Um, we're doing it mostly ourselves and uh, that's starting to be a relatively big burden now that we have like several hundred thousand users. Um, but we use this like email platform called Front. Um, mm, that's yeah. Gmail, so we can all kind of like share messages and like if we need different team members to like handle different things, we can kind of pass it around and like um, chat on a message before we like reply to it. So that's been pretty helpful for just kind of like scaling up our support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I yeah, also, oh, sorry. I just really quickly was also curious, like what are some interesting or surprising like requests that have come out of the user base that you have now, like so many people using it for all sorts of different things. Um, yeah, what's kind of struck you as interesting things to follow up on? Um, so now that we have this uh, community block, um, we also have like email and SMS collection. Um, so one request that we've been getting a lot recently is like, okay, I've collected all these emails on beacons, but I don't really know what to do with them. Like, can you help me send like outbound messages to these people? Um, and I think that would be really useful. Um, but there's also like other options for doing that, like community for texting, um, you know, platforms like MailChimp that have pre built out capabilities for sending emails. Um, and right now we're kind of leaning towards like integrating with those downstream platforms, but um, potentially building these kinds of like outbound channels could be a, a big project and like interesting for our creators um, if we were to do that. Yeah, and then people have like all kinds of the requests are definitely like kind of this long tail thing where we get yeah. a lot of requests for like things around payments, but then people ask for all kinds of random things. So, uh, yeah. What are some of the fun random things? Sorry? What are some of the fun random things that people ask for? Uh, a lot of them are like integrations with, you know, like 5,000 different platforms um, that <laughs> I've really heard of. Um, and I think, I think that's actually one challenge that we need to figure out how to deal with better, where right now we're building all the integrations ourselves. Um, but there's some similarities between us and like uh, a, a company like Shopify, where they're like much more of a, a true platform and like ecosystem that other people can build on top of. And they basically use the work of all those developers to serve this long tail of merchant needs um, that they would find it hard to like serve by themselves. And I think for us, um, since creators are, they're like businesses, but they're, they're really just people. Um, they're even more diverse than say e-commerce merchants, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they're going to have even more diverse needs. And I think at some point we need to maybe flip from um, building everything ourselves to letting other people build, build on beacons as a platform. Yeah. But probably, seems like you've... we'll probably wait till we have more than four people to, to make that shift. So. Yeah. <laughs> So, so as you're, um, as you're sort of, you know, at four people, it sounds like, you know, at least three of you all went to school together. So you probably all kind of in the same location. And mm -hmm. as we're moving out of kind of the COVID era, hopefully we're kind of putting a, a final finishing touches on that. Um, it seems like you could either go the direction of continuing to have everybody in place in Palo Alto or San Francisco or wherever, uh, or you could kind of take this totally radically new approach or kind of you know different approach that became more common in COVID to the sort of be fully distributed and people can be anywhere. And I wonder, do you sort of already have instincts on where you'd like it to go or how you think about that kind of topic? We've been thinking about it. We're still like obviously very early in figuring things out. We also, so I'm, this is like my studio apartment in San Francisco. Um, the four of us all, uh, lived in the same building until mm -hmm. a week ago. Um, <laughs> and now we're actually more distributed. One of my co-founders moved to San Mateo. Um, one of them is currently in like on the East coast visiting family and we'll be kind of traveling around for the rest of the year. Um, so I think we're going to try to learn how to do this remote thing. Um, but then at the end of the year, I think our plan is to all meet up back in SF and try to have like a core team here. But, um, Long term, maybe go towards like a hybrid structure because yeah, right. we have um, 
we, we have creators all over the world. So it, it seems like it would make sense to eventually have team members kind of spread out too. Um, but we'll see if we can manage that. Yeah, especially if you if you were having a, um, you know, like you mentioned kind of this developer platform idea, it feels like the kind of idea that could have whole communities that would assemble online and contribute to the work of beacons in various ways, both kind of maybe in commercial as well as kind of hobbyist, um, but sort of being more global in nature probably supports that goal too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I know we're we're reaching the end of, our, of the hour, so I don't want to... Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to take, take over your time more than we, we planned. Um, but, but we do like to wrap with kind of a few, a few uh, kind of of our usual questions, uh, which I can customize a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we're always excited about kind of new, new products and companies and, and builders and what, what makes people curious. And so, you know, you know, what, you know, as a high level, what are you curious about today? And that could be a new tool that you're using. It could be a new book or a blog post that you've read or something that's kind of inspired you in new ways uh, these days. And I actually want to want to hear from both Neil and Anne on this topic. And you want to go first or me? <laughs> I can actually go first. Um, so uh, let me share this. Um, I worked with an exec coach for a few sessions and he recommended this book called mm. um, nonviolent communication. And I, uh, and I think, I think for me, not that I was communicating violently, but uh, I actually, I tend to not know how to uh, translate or even like think through what are my feelings and be able to articulate them um, in a professional setting. So I tend to not articulate anything and maybe I will feel things and they, uh, you know, end up stacking up. Hmm. So... Uh, so I, this coach recommended um, this book, which I think has been very helpful in um, in helping me identify what are the right ways to even describe my emotions using language. And that's been, I think it's been very helpful for a, a lot of my relationships, not just in a professional setting. That's cool. Is there a quick example you can give us to just make sure we can anchor on like, would it be you're you're in a discussion about a new consumer trend and you disagree, but the room is going one way and you have a different way to say it? <laughs> it's less it. so, actually, I think it's actually less so um, in a uh, in a deal or a trend, okay. sort of a factual discussion, more so in um, how would I put it? I think more so in 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 areas of potential conflict or in areas of mm. potential like misunderstanding. Um, uh, where, um, I th like it, it teaches you how to, you know, how to show empathy to other people, how to resolve conflict, um, both frameworks and also, uh, you know, like verbal, um, words that are, uh, more, uh, conducive to setting up the right context. Mm -hmm. So as an example, um, like, like, you know, if you have a conflict with someone, what you could say is, oh, I, I want you to understand me, right? Or I I am, like, this is where I'm coming from. Like, I want blah. Hmm. Um, as opposed to, I think, like, you know, directly pushing your point, right? Or right. any other context. So there's, there's a lot of ways to phrase like things to help you get more comfortable with the uh, ideas you want to express that you may otherwise not have been comfortable expressing. Yeah, and and normally, yeah, I think otherwise I would normally not express anything um, because mm -hmm. uh, because I think um, let's see in 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 our on our investment team and just uh, I think in investing in many other uh, you know tech roles in general, um, everybody's very data driven and everybody's very factual and you know we're always talking about uh, you know things that are highly intellectual and factual and there's not a lot of room or understanding on how to how to discuss uh, feelings and where and when and how to bring them up. Yep. Cool. Well, and I talk more about that. You should come back and yeah. like, it's super interesting topic. So relevant to like everyone. Yeah. yeah. I learned a lot. I look cool. forward to and benefiting from your learnings. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be violent towards me. 
All right, we're we're running late, so we're gonna have to wrap at this because we're we got we got our next show starting a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> but we we've loved this conversation and would love to have you back and keep learning about your process and your journey as you're learning. Um, so we'll we'll uh, we'll follow up and, and do another one. Okay, sweet. Yeah, okay. yeah, guys, it's fun. <laughs>